Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. And the whole church said... Amen. Well, good morning, church. My name is Josh. I'm one of the ministers here. If you are a guest, a special welcome to you from our family to you. If you're looking for a church home or maybe just kicking the tires of faith, not really sure, we're just glad you're here. This is a great place to get to know people who are following this one named Jesus, who we believe not only came to give life, but is life himself. And so we're glad that you're here today. Now, we are in the middle of a series called Advent, and this isn't a new thing. Rather, since about the fourth century, Christians have gathered for the four weeks before Christmas to remember Jesus' coming. In fact, the word Advent means coming or arrival. And it is the four Sundays before Christmas where Christians remember that Jesus came as a baby and remember and anticipate that he will return as the king. It's the idea that says God kept his promise and sent Jesus. For hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, God's people said God would send the Messiah, the chosen one, the one who would rule, who would reign, who would save us, who would give us life. And then in a little obscure town called Bethlehem, that Messiah was born. God kept his promise. And so the church now says if God would keep his promise, we have the confidence that he will keep his next promise, which is the return of Jesus, not as a baby, but as our king. And so for the four weeks, we're looking at the four words of Advent. Week one, we looked at the word hope. And just by way of reminder, hope means that God is not done yet. Whatever you're going through, the confidence we have is that what you see is not all there is because God is not done yet. He is coming back. And then last week we looked at love and we said that the love candle symbolizes that God's love is not selective or for a few people, but God's love is for blank. You fill in the blank. Who is it for? It's for everyone. No matter their past, no matter their present, no matter what they have done, no matter what they are doing, God loves everyone. And today, we're going to light the candle for joy. Now, the fact is, our, our world is hungry for happiness. Have you noticed this? In fact, this time of year has sort of a weird push-me-pull-you-to-it. You have those who talk about Jesus and then you have those who talk about junk. Now, we don't call it that. We call them commercials. And those commercials have all sorts of treasures that you can get. And our kids get magazines in the mail. And they remind us of all the treasures that they want. And life would be good if they only got this toy or this thing. And then everything would be happy and complete and great. In fact, I was thinking about it earlier this week about some of the gifts that I was convinced would make my life complete as a child. And the fact is, my toys, some of them are still back in Nashville. I don't have them here. But if I were able to get them for you, what I would bring out and put right here was my most pr prized collection of action figures. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yes, directly from God, absolutely. I was convinced. Heroes in a half shell turtle power. And it was one of those things growing up, I was convinced if I could just get Leonardo, Donatello, Raphael, and Michelangelo, then my life would be complete. And then I got those and it was like, no, that's not enough. I need splinter. Some of you are going, you wanted a splinter? No, no, no. I wanted the rat sensei. I, it, this is an acid trip from the 60s made in form, okay? And I want the shredder. You go, you want a shredder like for cheese? No, he was the villain. You're like, this is the weirdest toy ever. Yes, but I was convinced that if I had those toys, my life would be complete. And here's what's amazing. Isn't it interesting how we are convinced that the most absurd things can bring us happiness? 
Here I am some years later, and I'll tell you, I got those toys, but I'm still looking for happy. Is anyone else in the market for happiness? We value happiness. In fact, as Americans, we're familiar with the phrase, life, liberty, and the pursuit of what? Happiness. We all want it. And if we don't have it, we assume that to get it means we have to go find it. And so many of us, we say, well, I know where happiness is found. Happiness is found in something else. If I can just get that new thing, I will find happy. But here's how I know that is not true. Because every other thing that I thought would bring happiness didn't. Why do I believe that this new thing would bring happiness when everything else I thought would bring happiness didn't? What is the definition of insanity, church? Doing the same thing over and over but expecting different results. So we think that to find happiness means it's going to be in something else. Others say, no, it's not in something else. They say, well, it's in someone else. So if I just get a girlfriend or a boyfriend, then I will find happiness. And then you get into that and you go, whoa, if I could just get a different boyfriend or girlfriend, then I'd find happiness. And then others say, no, 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 no. Happiness is found when I find my soulmate, the one who will complete me. You complete me. And you say, really? Yes, so if we just get a little ring, put it on her finger, then men, we will find happiness. And ladies, you think if he will just show up and give you the ring, you will find happiness. And we say, I am so happy until the day after the honeymoon. And you realize this person may be a gift from God, but they are not God and then we think, okay, so happiness is not in this person. It'll be when we have children. Then I will be happy if I could just have a child. And then you have that child and you go, well, maybe if I have two children because one didn't do it, but two will do it. Hmm? And so you think more. And then some of you say, no, 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 no. It's not in someone else. Rather, it's when I get rid of someone else. When college comes for the kids, when they leave the house and we change the locks on the door, then I will be happy. But happy doesn't seem to come, and so it's not in something else or someone else. And then some of us say, well, I know, I will find happiness somewhere else. If I can just get out of town, if I can just get a little bit of a break, if I can take some time for me, then I will find happiness. I remember when Lindsay and I were newlyweds living in Texas. We didn't have a lot of money, so we'd save up for like a little overnight trip somewhere. And the place that we chose to go was San Antonio, only a couple hours away. And I remember the, the time that we decided to go do this. It was a little hectic season in ministry. I don't know if you've had hectic seasons in life. Probably a lot of us have had those. And we just thought, if we can just get out of Dodge, if we can leave for a few days, then, then we will be happy. So we made a big deal of this. We're going to get our, our, our nicest clothes because we're going to go eat out somewhere nice, like not McDonald's nice. It's going to be a place that the person serves you. You don't get a number. It's going to be great. And, and we're going to go stay in a hotel. Now, it, you know, we'll stomp on the cockroaches, but it will be a hotel. And so we get to San Antonio, and I remember as soon as we get out of the car, and we are about to go down this beautiful river walk. And we're thinking, this is going to be the best day. We will be happy here as soon as we walked out. Not 10 minutes later, we're walking along, and my wife, she's beautiful. My wife's just gorgeous, absolutely, from day one. She's a beautiful woman, but she's dressed up and all. We start walking down the river walk, and all of a sudden, we're talking about how great the day is, and all of a sudden, you can almost hear the sound of a bomb dropping. And that bomb landed on my wife's forehead from a bird. All I got to say is happy went out the window. How many of us know that you can get that something else, you can be with that someone else, you can go that somewhere else, and then life drops a bomb right on your head, doesn't it? <laughs> Happiness is fleeting. So is, it is so important that to this morning we distinguish between this desire for happy, which is a good thing, it's an emotion, a sense that things are okay, but recognize that happiness is not something that we can create. In fact, notice this, we cannot create happiness. 
Every time you have tried to create it, you may be able to work things out for a few moments or a few hours or a few days, but eventually you have no ability to maintain it because we don't control our circumstances. We can't create happiness because we do not control our circumstances, what happens around us. You do not get to control the actions of others. You do not get to control the economy. You do not get to control how people view you entirely. Now, we have influence, but you cannot control it. But happiness is one of those things that comes and it seems to go so quickly. And so, happiness, here's a key idea. Happiness comes from the outside in, what goes on around us. But Christians have discovered the secret. In this time of year, this is so important that we get this one right, church. Happiness comes from outside in. Well, if this happens, if that happens, if these people are around me, if I get this thing, if I get this stuff, if I'm over here, if I'm over there, then I am happy. But church, happiness and joy are very different. Happiness comes from the same root word as happenstance, chance, or happening. Here's what's just going on. Happiness starts from the outside in, but there's this thing called joy. It comes from the inside out. Now, all this is obvious and basic. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, but here's what's at stake. The world is desperate for something more than fleeting happiness. And the world is like cookie monster, gobbling up the latest cookie, thinking this one will satisfy, this one will satisfy. By the way, how many of you know who cookie monster is? Just show of hands. We had a real uh, parenting faux pas moment earlier this week. This has nothing to do with the message, but I, I'll tell on us. We, were, we have these little placemats uh, for the kids when they're doing crafts, and one of them is a Sesame Street placemat, and it has the different characters and shapes and all, and Stephen had it at his spot, and he's like, hey, look at that shape, look at this shape, and mom says, hey, what shape is Bert holding? And, and Stephen then points to um, two shapes that Big Bird is holding. Now, my, my son is not colorblind, nor is he animal insufficient here. I mean, he knows characters, but she goes, that's not Bert. And he goes, well, I don't know who Bert is. And Lindsay looks at me and goes, I have failed them because I did not raise them with Sesame Street. So, Cookie Monster, he's the big blue guy. Cookies, if he just gets one more, then he's satisfied, but he's never satisfied. Joy comes from the inside out, not from the inside, outside in. And here's the deal. I want you to understand. David, the king of Israel, centuries before Jesus, one of Jesus's earthly ancestors understood the distinction between happiness and joy. He understood that one was a joy or was a, a fun thing to have, but fleeting. And the other one was something that could be produced and enjoyed no matter what was going on. You say, how in the world did David, the king of Israel, Understand what it was like to not have anything but a charmed life. After all, he's chosen as king. He defeats Goliath and becomes the toast of the Israelite nation. He gets to be the man on the throne. He establishes the city of Jerusalem, the new headquarters of the Israelite people. He is the greatest king of Israel ever. What do you mean he didn't, he knew what it was like to not have happiness. Oh, he understood. If you know David's story, you know that David's seven brothers despised him. His daddy Jesse forgot about him, left him in a field. King Saul, the king before David, tried to have David killed. David's first wife was embarrassed by David, and David's son tried to dethrone and have his daddy killed. So you tell me, did David know what it was like to have circumstances that were not good? Absolutely. And yet, the words he shares in Psalm 16, I think, are so applicable because even if you've never had a kid try to kill you, you know what it's like to search for something that you can't find because of circumstances. And so all I want to do this morning is I want to show you a couple things from David's, path, David's story here because the world is looking for something solid. And the church is God's answer to the question, where will we find this joy? So when you see people who are not joyful, it is not simply they who lose out. It is the world who loses out as well. And so David, he makes this very interesting idea. He points out that Joy comes from the inside out. Verse 2 says, I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Notice this, apart from you, I have no good thing. 
He starts off the bat saying, it's not what happens around me that gives me joy, it's what's happening in me that produces joy. Jesus, God, you are the one who fills me and gives me good things. By the way, James chapter one tells us that every good gift you have ever had comes from God. By the way, just real quick, take a deep breath, would you just? You're welcome. That was from God. The clothes that you're wearing, that's a gift from God. You say, no, no, I, my wife bought this for me at Kohl's. You say, where do you think you got the money? Well, I work for that. Where do you think you got the ability to work? Oh, mm, you're welcome. Every good gift you have ever received comes from God. And David starts off by saying, God, it is what's happening in me that produces something outside of me, apart from you, I have no good thing. But look at what he says now in verse 11. He says, you have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy. Meaning I cannot find joy out there. I can't go to the store and say, um, I'll take a, a medium joy, please, with a shot of happy. You can't go and order it at your favorite Starbucks. You can't go and order it at your favorite salon. You can't go and order it on Amazon. Look, I know Amazon has everything, but they don't sell joy. He says, it is in you that I have found joy. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Meaning, if you want the present of joy this Christmas, it can only be found in the presence of God. David makes it very clear. You can look for it but you will not find it in your circumstances. You will only find it in the one who has come to you. It is in you and through you and because of you, dear God, that we can have this joy. Dave, he puts it this way. God's presence in you produces joy through you. God's presence in you produces joy through you. Now, here's the big question. Right now, this is where most people might end and we'd say, okay, so go out there, be joyful. God's here. Merry Christmas. And most of us would say, okay, how do I do this? Because here's the reality. If it is true that God's presence in you produces joy through you, then quick question, church, don't, don't point to anyone. Have you ever met a Christian who was not joyful. Now, don't poke that person sitting next to you. Don't, don't look over at them. Don't give them a wink. But have you ever met someone who calls on Jesus and yet you could not tell that they were in Christ because they do not seem to have any joy? Why is it that you can have two people in the same church, one seems so very full of joy and the other one feels like their tank is empty? If it's true that God's presence produces this joy, then where is my joy? Maybe you're asking this morning, well, where is my joy? David again gives us the secret to joy production. And it is one of the most beautiful things, if we will but pause and consider this, he gives this great idea of where joy comes from because you see, joy is not something you produce, it's simply something that can be developed. It is not something that you produce in you, it's something that is developed, joy is developed, here we go, when we practice praise. Joy is developed when we practice praise. Notice what he says in this next verse. He says, I will praise the Lord. The entire ver chapter here, if you were to go through, the whole piece is a praise to God. It is a celebration of who he is and what he is doing in our lives lives. What, what David is experiencing, he says, I will praise the Lord. Now, I didn't highlight this, and I should have, because maybe the most important two words of this entire section are these first two words. Just real quickly with me, with one voice, very loud, will you say these two words out loud? You ready? I will. Let's say it again. I will. I will. Meaning it is a choice. Praise does not happen simply when we feel like it. It is a choice. Did you know that praising God is a choice? He does not say, I'll praise you when I feel like it. I'll praise you when circumstances are going my way. I'll praise you 
when I get that great dinner that I know my wife can make, but she just isn't making it. I'll praise you when my kids behave. I'll praise you when my boss recognizes my achievements and my value. I'll praise you when, no, he just says, I will praise you. He is making a choice to say, no matter what happens, I will praise you. Did you know that praise is what cultivates joy in your heart more than anything else? When you say, God, no matter my circumstances, I choose to say you are good. I choose to say you are worthy. I choose to say you are holy. I choose to say I love you. That is what ends up producing joy more than anything else. In fact, just look at all the words he uses here. He says, I will praise the Lord. Notice this next line, who counsels me. You say, what's the big deal of this? Listen, there are days when I need to have someone explain to me that all I see is not all that there really is. There are moments where circumstances are so bleak, so dire, that I need someone to say, you don't see the whole picture and you can't, but remember hope, God's not done yet. It is when we praise him and say, God, I do not know what's going on, I cannot see everything that's happening, but I choose to praise you, that you are in control. In your hands are all of life's situations. It's when we do this. So he says, God, I'm, I'm going to remind myself that you counsel me. In fact, look at this. Even at night, my heart instructs me. Night, when David is talking about this, he's not just talking about the end of the day. But how many of us know that we have gone through seasons of night? Seasons where things are just not going well. In fact, right now, it's interesting that Advent, the coming of Jesus, the light of the world, just so happens to take place during some of the shortest days of the year. Night is longer. I was talking to a friend not too long ago. And this friend was sharing some situation with their own health and the health of their mother and the health of a friend and a job situation. And this friend simply said, Josh, I feel like it's dark everywhere. I just feel like I'm in the dark. And I know if we paused, if, if, if you and I could sit down for a cup of coffee or, and just talk, so many of you would say the same thing. You'd say, the depression is just debilitating. You'd say, my kids, I pray for them, but they do not choose Jesus, and I can't, I can't seem to get them to come back. Some of you would say, I'm hanging on to my marriage, but I'm not sure what tomorrow is going to bring. For some of you, you'd say, I just, I just feel lonely. I just wish I had somebody. And for so many of us, we would say, it feels like night. My circumstances are dark. I have no happiness. And yet, David says, even at night, even as I'm hiding in the caves from King Saul who wants to kill me, even as I'm fleeing from my own palace because my son wants to depose me, even when I'm left out into the field because my daddy thinks I'm so insignificant, he doesn't bring me before the prophet Samuel to possibly be the next king. Even though my circumstances are dark and it is bleak, my heart instructs me. Now, in the ancient world, the heart was not the seat of the emotions. Rather, the heart represented the core of who you are. It was his way of saying, in my deepest places, I will choose to speak to myself instead of letting my circumstances speak to me. I choose to praise you. In the moments where it's dark, I choose to say in that moment, you are still good, you are still God, you are still on the throne. Praise is a choice, and it's what develops joy. He says, I will praise the Lord who counsels me even at night. My heart instructs me, notice this, I have set the Lord always before me. I was thinking about the things that we put in front of us are usually the things we value the most. So my wife and I share a room because she is the most precious relationship on earth that I have. We have pictures all over our house of our children because they are precious to us. In other words, what we value, we put in front of us. And I love how David is like saying, God, I have put your picture in front of my face so that wherever I go, although the circumstances may be dark, even though things may not be good, even though it feels like the world is dropping all sorts of stuff on me, I have you before me. 
I will choose to look at you. I will choose to consider you. I will choose to recognize you. I have set the Lord always before me because, notice this, he is at my right hand. It's not just I think he is near, but rather he is, friend, listen to me. David is saying that your God is as close as your next breath, that he is not distant or far away. And just because it feels like night, he is the light who walks with you. He is at my right hand, and as a result, I will not be shaken. This idea of joy is developed by practicing praise. You say, well, what is praise? Praise is simply this. Praise is practicing the presence of God. Praise is simply saying, I know he is here even when I feel like he's far I know that he loves me even when I see so much pain. I know that God is still at work even when the world seems to be spiraling out of control. Praise says you are good even though the world isn't always. Praise is practicing the presence of God. It's remembering that he is near. I was thinking about it that isn't it interesting that one of the names for Jesus is Emmanuel, which simply means God with us that the presence of God is here. Did you understand that right now God is here in this room? Maybe I need to say that again for some of you who didn't hear it. Did you realize that God, the creator of all that is, the one who was born as a baby, who grew up, who stretched his hands out on a cross, who died for you, who was in a grave, came out of that grave and ascended, that that God is in this room right now. Did you know that, church? Now, here's the reality. Some of us may say that with our mouths but not believe it with our hearts. Praise is one of the ways you begin to strengthen your joy muscle. Some of us just need to strengthen it and begin to recite to the Lord the good things he has done. You have saved me from my sins. You have given me hope beyond this life. You have given me purpose in this life. You have given me the comforter, the Holy Spirit. God, you are with me. You want to live through me so I can be a light to other people. Praise is practicing the presence of God. There's a story of a man who, this was many years ago, and it's a fictitious account, but there was a man who lived in a small village who, like many of us, became somewhat disillusioned with life because he'd been looking and looking and could not find what he wanted. Now, he had a wife who adored him, children who thought he hung the moon. He had a job that he enjoyed, and he had friends who spoke highly of him, and yet... He could not get rid of this nagging sense that there must be something more. And he kept hearing whispers of a place called paradise. Some place that if you got there, it just brought this joy and this sense of purpose and belonging. And he could not get it out of his mind. And so one morning, sitting over his familiar bowl of oatmeal. How many of us like oatmeal in this room? He sat there. And he decided right then and there that he would stop dreaming about paradise and he would go find it. So he put on his shoes, leaving the oatmeal on the table. He walked out the front door through the gate with a broken latch and he left town never to return or at least that was his plan. And he begins out the door and he goes. And for three days he traveled and every night as he would get ready to go to bed, he would take off his shoes, and he would point them in the direction that he was traveling, the direction of paradise. And every morning when he would wake up, he would quickly get back in his shoes, and he would continue walking in the direction of paradise until the third night he took off his shoes and in the dark by accident kicked his makeshift compass around 180 degrees Next morning, he hops up, gets in his shoes, and instead of going in the direction he thought was paradise, he began to go back the way he came. Three days he traveled every night, hopping in his shoes, continuing on until the third day he crested this hill, and he looked down, and there was this village. And he thought, aha, paradise, I found it. But as he looked, he said, it looks kind of familiar. Evidently, the man was not very smart. 
And he said, it looks so familiar, but after all, people say, there's a place called Paradise. I've been traveling for it. Must be it. He comes down the hill. He enters into the town of Paradise where all the friends greet him by name. He thought, how strange. And then he thought, well, of course they would say my name. After all, this is Paradise. He continued through the town to the end of the street where he came upon this gate with a broken latch. He passed through it, and as he opened the door to the house sitting there, he heard the sweet voices of children, Daddy, as his two little ones came and wrapped themselves around him. The smell of dinner hitting his nose. He goes, oh, that smells good. His wife comes over to him, and she kisses him on the lips as though she means it. Can I get an amen from the men? He sits down to dinner, and he takes a deep breath, and he goes, Paradise, I found it. He simply discovered what David has been saying for centuries that what you are looking for, the heart's desire of every person, what we keep going and saying, well, if I can just get out there, I'll find it someone else, somewhere else, something else. And the truth of Scripture is that you do not need to go to find joy because joy has a name, and his name is Jesus, and joy came to you. He left his home So he could bring to you what you and I could not bring to ourselves, this well of happiness and joy and contentment that circumcedes, that is greater than our circumstances. And there's this beautiful passage in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12 and verse 2, where the writer encourages you and me in the moments where the seasons are just dark. And you say, circumstances don't work. Why? What do I do? And the Hebrew writer says these words, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. In other words, you point your shoes to Jesus. He is your home. He is your paradise. He is your joy. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, meaning the one who created what you have and the one who will complete what you have. Who, notice this now, for the joy set before him. Now, this is a strange passage, and commentators have marveled at this for centuries. Jesus had something that he would receive joy in who for the joy set before Jesus, notice this, his joy allowed him to endure the cross, to scorn its shame. In other words, the joy Jesus had enabled him to go through dark nights. So if you want to be like Jesus, if you want to experience joy, you fix your eyes on him. So what what was his joy? Now some people have said, well, you know, the joy of Jesus was heaven, to be with his father, But church, as commentators have pointed out, that doesn't make any sense. Where was Jesus before he came to earth? And the church says, heaven. Who resides in heaven, church? God the Father. Jesus already had God the Father. He was already at home in heaven. And yet the scripture says, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. So what is it that he endured the cross for? What was the joy that he held on to, he looked forward to, that enabled him to endure the cross? You want, you want to know what it is? This is so incredible to me. You are the joy of Jesus. He did not have to leave heaven if he wanted to stay with God, if God was the exclusive place of his joy. He did not have to leave heaven if the praise of the angels is what was everything. He had to leave heaven for you, for me. In other words, he put on his shoes and he pointed them for you. You say, wait, wait, are you suggesting that, that Jesus, that somehow we, we give Jesus joy? I'm not suggesting it. That's what the Hebrew writer is saying. See, here's what's so incredible. Advent, the coming of Jesus, is the promise that God brings joy, and he came and gets joy as he brings it to you. 
So this morning, here's the promise, no matter what dark night you may go through or are going through, Jesus, the joy of mankind, has set his shoes towards you. And you can set your shoes towards him. And so this morning, we're going to light the candle of joy. And the candle simply means joy has come to us. Do you need joy this morning? Do you know someone else who needs joy this morning? I want you to maybe settle yourself for a moment. Put your feet firmly on the floor. Go ahead, just get them set for a second here. And ask yourself the question, in which direction are my shoes pointing? Am I looking for joy out there? Am I just continuing to try to get, 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 because it's just, I can't find it? Or are your shoes firmly fixed towards home with Jesus?